Bibles and open them to Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15. Uh, I have the privilege of going down this summer to a camp that I grew up going to, uh, Camp Susquehanna. And I get to go back uh, as a chaplain this year. I did that last summer. It was a great privilege, and I get to go back this year. Uh, I remember one thing distinctly growing up um, and going to this camp. There was lots of good memories made. Um, one of the things that, uh, that shocked me about going to the United States, Canadian and United States culture, they're very different, right? Like, we look similar and we sound similar in many ways, but we're very different. One of the most shocking ways that I learned that they were different is that they have um, bad iced tea. Somebody agrees. Thank you. Was that you, Pat? Thank you. They have bad iced tea. Uh, when I was like eight, nine years old, I'm going down, we're at the camp, and they got iced tea. And I'm going, oh, great, iced tea. I love iced tea. And you know how Canadians do iced tea, right? You get that big box of powdery sugar the nesty stuff, and you pour, it's basically just straight sugar, colored sugar, and you pour it into the water, and it's basically sugar water, right? That's iced tea. That's Canadian, that is real iced tea. Well, down in America, they claim that they have the real iced tea, which is just cold tea with no sugar. And so the first time I drank that iced tea, I was disgusted. This, this is awful. This is not iced tea. You call this iced tea? Where's the sugar? I don't see the lump of sugar in the bottom. This doesn't count. This isn't real. I was, I was appalled at the differences of iced teas. I, I rejected it. I, was, I said, no way. I'm not drinking that. It is no good. I rejected their iced tea because it was different, because it's not what I was expecting, and quite frankly, because it tasted gross, but amongst other things, because it wasn't what I was expecting. When we come to the New Testament, when we come to Mark's Gospel, when we come to the trial of Jesus, and as we look at the passage this morning of, of Jesus' crucifixion, we see that Jesus is rejected because he's different than expected. He's a different kind of king, and he's rejected for being different, for being unexpected. And the people who are a part of his crucifixion, do not understand, they don't see why his difference is good, why his difference is necessary, why, even though he doesn't fit into their category of what a king ought to be, how this different kind of king is actually exactly what they need. So let's read Mark chapter 15. I'm gonna begin reading in verse 16 and we'll read down to the end of verse 32. This is what Holy Scripture says to us today. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in a purple cloak and twisted together a crown of thorns, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, They stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him and they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place uh, called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests and the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his word. Would you please... Bow with me for a word of prayer. God.
God in heaven, we have just been singing of your death and resurrection. We have just been contemplating and reflecting on the price that was paid on our behalf. Lord, I pray that as we come to your word that once again directs us to consider the death of our Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray that you would help us to to come at it with, with fresh hearts and fresh minds. Many of us, Lord, have, have heard this passage over and over again, just like we've heard the Christmas story over and over again. And yet, Lord, may we not just affirm some things that we knew intellectually or, or even grow and learn some things intellectually. May you help us by your spirit in our hearts know more about you so that we might follow you more faithfully. We thank you for our Savior, Jesus. And we pray that this morning as the kids are downstairs, as they are hearing of Jesus, as they are hearing of, of who you are and what you've done for sinners on the cross, I, I pray that you would open up their hearts to receive the gospel of grace. Help us now as we continue to worship you as we study your word. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Last week, if you were here with us last week, you uh, will remember that we considered something, we saw something that was incredibly unfair. Something incredibly unfair took place. And it was this, that Barabbas, the guilty condemned sinner, was set free and Jesus, the innocent, pure, holy Lamb of God, was condemned to die. Jesus was condemned even though he's innocent. He's innocent religiously. He has not blasphemed God. He has not done anything before the Sanhedrin to warrant death. And he's innocent politically. Pilate himself, though Mark does not record it, Pilate himself will say, this man has done nothing deserving of death. He has done nothing against the state of Rome. He has done nothing against the religion of the Jews. He is innocent. And yet, he's still condemned. Jesus is going to die, but his death isn't going to be honorable. It's not going to be peaceful. Everything we read in this passage reeks of mockery, smells of humiliation. They don't just want Jesus to die. They want his death to be his humiliation. They want to strip him of his dignity, of his honor. And that's what everything in this passage is designed to do. Everything that they are doing to Jesus is designed to strip him of whatever dignity he may have had. But why is Jesus subjected to this this kind of humiliation? He is forced to go through this because of what they think of Jesus, the conclusions that they've come to about Jesus, because they see Jesus as a different kind of king. And this different kind of king isn't the king that they wanted. And in their minds, he's a king that kind of stinks. And so what we see in this passage, I've broken it down into three sections for us. There are three different instances where Jesus is mocked. And in those mockings, in that mockery, what we see is these differences of opinion, these differences of understanding being pulled out. The first thing that we see is that Jesus is mocked because they think he's a fraud. A fraud. You know what a fraud is? a fake, an imposter, a pretender. They mock Jesus because they see the way that he has taught, the way that he interacts with people, the message that he proclaims, and they think he's a fraud. They mock Jesus because they think he's pretending, and in particular, pretending to be a king. Look at verse 16. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion and they clothed him in a purple cloak and twisting together a crown of thorns they put it on him and they began to salute him hail king of the jews and they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him do you see what the what the roman soldiers are doing they've picked very particular things things that that normally indicate kingship that normally point to royalty and they're twisting them into cruel mockeries They're twisting them as a way of humiliating Jesus. They clothe him in purple cloth, right? A purple robe. Purple was expensive. It was expensive because of the dye that was used to make something purple. It was very expensive because it was very hard to get. And so because it was expensive, only the rich could have it. 
And because only the rich could have it, it came to symbolize royalty. Kings wore purple because kings were rich, because kings had power, because kings had authority. It became a symbol of kingship. But then there's another thing, something else that uh, is perhaps the more obvious symbol of royalty, at least to us, they crown him with a crown. They give him something and they put something on his head. You're not a king without a crown, right? That's why even little kids, when they get a crown, what do they say? I'm the king. I'm the queen. It symbolizes that royalty. But this crown is different. This crown is made up of thorns. It's a sadistic and cruel twist that's designed not just to mock but also to inflict pain in the mockery. They kneel down and they pay homage to Jesus, right? Or rather, they're, they're pretending to in verse 19, right? Because what are they doing as they kneel? They're striking him on the head and they're spitting on him and kneeling down to pay homage. They're pretending to say, ah, yes, here we are bowing before you, king of the Jews. They pretend to praise him and they say, hail, hail, king of the Jews. Something that they would have said to Caesar, their, their king, they twist it and they make fun of Jesus They pretend to honor him because they think he's a pretender. And the mockery continues even after they've left the palace. This just happens in the palace. But after they leave, we see that in verse 23, they they offer Jesus wine mixed with myrrh. Some people think that that, um, wine mixed with myrrh that myrrh had some sort of narcotic effect or numbing effect, so it's actually, it's being offered to Jesus as a way of numbing the pain that he is about to go through as he's crucified, or to numb the pain of the scourging, the whipping, the beating that he has just endured. Um, that's, that's possible, but there seems to be very little evidence that, that myrrh actually had a numbing effect. It didn't actually do that. There does appear to be a heavy amount of evidence, a great amount of evidence that indicates that myrrh isn't, doesn't have a numbing effect. It actually has a, a seasoning effect, flavoring effect. So what does Starbucks do every October? They bring out the pumpkin spice, right? It's kind of like what myrrh is. It's, it's a flavoring thing. It's a sweet spice that flavors the drink. So they're offering Jesus some flavored wine, some spiced wine. What are they doing? Why would they bother to do that? Well, if we see it in the greater context of mockery, the soldiers are offering Jesus, they're offering the king some fine wine before he heads to the execution table. Ah, yes, king, let us serve you one last cup of wine. We'll even throw in a little bit of spice for you. It's heaping on the mockery. Jesus refuses, he doesn't drink. He's not playing their games. He can't stop them. He's not going to stop them from mocking him, but he refuses to engage with them in their mockery. And then in verse 26, we see that there is an inscription, an inscription that's posted with the condemned. And this was common. The the Romans would post the crime. They would post the, the reason for execution with the criminal, partly as a deterrent, so that others would go, okay, that's what that guy did, so I'm not going to do that. Make sure I don't do that so I don't get caught and killed. And what we see in verse 26 is that his crime is what? Why is Jesus killed? Because he is the king of the Jews. He's killed for being, in their eyes, a royal pretender. He is a fraud. They don't really think he's a king. They don't really think he's the king of the Jews. And maybe if they do, because there might be a sense in which they're, they're looking at Jesus and going, yeah, you're the perfect king of the Jews. The Jews, they're not very strong. They're not very powerful. They're weak and feeble people, and you are a fitting king for them. You are beaten, and you're on your way to your death. But likely, they don't actually think Jesus is king at all. What kind of king gets betrayed by his people and in that kind of way. He's not the king of the Jews and he's not the king of anyone else. They mock him because they think Jesus is a fraud. He's a fake. He's pretending. He's not what they were expecting. And so they reject him. The second thing that we see is that Jesus is mocked because they think he's a disgrace. The differences in Jesus make them think he's a fraud, but they also think he's a disgrace. A disgrace, not not worthy of honor, not worthy of respect, not worthy of due process when it comes to going through the court system. He is not worthy of honor. He is a disgrace, which makes him worthy of a dishonorable 
death. They mock Jesus with the type of execution that they subject him to. Look in verse 20, or sorry, 21. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. The the act of crucifixion, the execution decisions that were made surrounding crucifixion. Crucifixion was, was reserved for Rome's worst enemies. This was not something for a Roman citizen. This was reserved for uh, slaves. It was reserved for violent criminals. It was reserved for prisoners of war. It was reserved for the lower classes of people in society. It was not, no Roman citizen could be crucified. It was against the Roman law because of how brutal, how horrific, not just painful, but how humiliating and shameful the act of crucifixion was. It was designed not just to kill. It was designed to humiliate. It was designed specifically to torture the condemned with shame. One of the ways they did that was by forcing the condemned to carry their own cross. As you were condemned in the court, by the king, by the governor, inside the city, you were forced to carry the beam, the cross beam. So as you see here, that cross section that goes across, it was either there or sometimes fastened closer to the top. They were forced to carry that larger beam that went across. They would have to put it on their shoulders and they would have to carry their own means of execution through the city and out to the place where they would be executed. Jesus, as we read in verse 21, Jesus is apparently too weak to even carry his own cross. Simon of Cyrene is pulled in. He is forced to carry the cross. Why? Because Jesus has been scourged. He has been flayed and beaten by the Romans, as well as beaten by the Jewish Sanhedrin hours before. It appears as if he's too weak to carry his own cross, so Simon is brought in to do it for him. The condemned were were then taken outside the city and they were stripped naked and they were executed in public. There was no dignity. There was no honor in your death. You weren't hidden in a corner. You weren't executed in private. It was a public affair. Everything was designed to increase the shame. Even by stripping you naked in front of everybody else as they passed by, it was designed to humiliate you even more. And death came, came very, very slowly. Some people lasted days or even weeks hanging on a cross. The condemned were either tied or nailed. I read of some examples in Roman history of individuals being actually impaled on a cross. Um, the crosses were, were much more narrow and, and their bodies were forced through the cross and they were forced to hang on a cross with the cross actually impaled inside of them. Very few bodies actually died because of blood loss. They died because their bodies eventually just gave up. The way that they were fastened and the way that the condemned would actually sink down with only the nails or the ropes holding them up, they would actually be unable to breathe out. And so they'd have to push themselves up to be able to breathe out and breathe in. And because they're getting weaker and weaker, they would sink down. So eventually, they would just suffocate. Some, their hearts would just explode. Some, their hearts would just give out. Some would die because they were uh, eaten by birds and wild animals. Some due to exposure because of the sun, the heat, whatever it may be. 
the Roman lawyer who lived in the first century BC, Cicero, he wrote of crucifixion and he said, it was the cruelest and most hideous punishment possible. Not just inflicting physical pain, but inflicting emotional, spiritual, personal humiliation. Crucifixion is not the kind of death a king deserves. Some will say that there is honor in dying in the battlefield, a king leading his troops into battle, and so he dies on the battlefield, but he dies with honor. He dies leading his troops, protecting his his country, protecting his family, and he dies surrounded by brothers in arms. He still dies, but he dies with honor. There are examples throughout history of of royalty that are, their country is taken over and to ensure that they don't create a revolt, they are executed, they are killed. But the ones that were killed uh, inhumanely and there are some that were killed humanely or honorably as if you could kill somebody humanely. Some were given the honor of a swift death, a swift beheading. The knife, the axe was extra sharp, and so you weren't subjected to great torture and pain. Crucifixion is the exact opposite of an honorable death. It's the exact opposite of a peaceful death. Only the disgraced, only the shameful were subjected to crucifixion. And Jesus is mocked with crucifixion because they think he's a disgrace, that he's shameful that who he is as a king is not worthy of honor or respect. The final thing that we see is that Jesus is mocked because they think he's a failure. They think he's a fraud, he's a fake, he's pretending to be king, and because he's pretending to be king, he's actually a terrible disgrace and he deserves the worst of deaths. And Jesus is mocked because they think he's a failure. They think he's a a dud, a flop, that he's a a washout. Everyone, and as we read from verse 29 down to the end of verse 32, everyone thinks Jesus is a loser. He's mocked by those who pass by, by the Jewish pilgrims. Remember what's taking place at this moment as Jesus is being crucified. It's the Passover celebration. The city is filled with pilgrims, filled with Jewish pilgrims who have come from all over the world. And as they pass by, they mock him. Look in verse 29. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. They, they deride Jesus. A word that perhaps, well, I don't know if you use it. I don't use that word all that much. That word means to, to hurl profane or evil words at somebody. In other words, they cuss Jesus out. They start cussing at him as he hangs on the cross. They think he's failed his mission, right? You who, who said you would destroy the temple, what are you doing? You clearly haven't succeeded in your mission. Death usually brings an end to the mission, right? What, means, what makes a mission a successful mission? If you think of the army or something else, it means getting home alive. Jesus is hanging on a cross. He's dying. Therefore, his mission is unsuccessful. They don't understand that his death actually is his mission. They think he's a failure. They think he's unable to deliver on his promises. You said you were going to do this. And now clearly, because you're dying, you're not going to be able to do that. You're a failure. And then he's mocked also by the Sanhedrin. He's mocked by those people who are just randomly passing by, but he's mocked by the people who followed the Roman soldiers and Jesus out to to Golgotha to make sure that Jesus was killed. He's mocked by the Sanhedrin. They also think Jesus is a loser. Look in verse 31. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. The Sanhedrin think they've won, right? 
They've been battling with Jesus off and on for roughly three years. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to get rid of him. And now they think they finally defeated Jesus. They look at Jesus hanging on the cross and they think he's weak. They think he's frail. They think he's feeble. They think his power is gone. That finally his power has been sapped. The power that he displayed by feeding 5,000 people, the power that he displayed by making Lazarus rise from the dead, the power that he displayed in healing all the sick and casting out demons and calming the storm, they think that power is now gone. And they mock him. And this is interesting. Mark says they mock him to one another. They, they get together in their little groups. And he, 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 he. We finally got him. I just picture like little gremlins or something. You know, ha, 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 ha. We, we finally got him. That, that's what they're doing. They're standing in front of him and they're turning to one another and mocking him to one another. We finally got him. And they think Jesus is a loser, unable to save himself. They think they have more power than Jesus. And then finally, just almost, just kind of thrown in there at the end of verse 32, we see that Jesus is finally mocked by, by the robbers that are hanging next to him, the criminals. Verse 32, halfway through there, those who were crucified with him also reviled him. He's mocked, he's reviled by those who suffer the same fate as him. One commentator put it this way, that, that this is the ultimate shaming humiliation. Why? Because Jesus is refused brotherhood. He's refused companionship even in death. The Sanhedrin have turned against him. The passers-by have turned against him. The Roman soldiers have turned against him. Everybody has turned against him. And you might think that there, there might be some consolation by those that are hanging next to him, saying, man, this kind of stinks, doesn't it? He doesn't have that companionship even with those who are dying with him. Even the criminals dying next to him also think Jesus is a loser, a failure, defeated. Jesus is mocked because they think he's a failure, a fraud, and a disgrace. They mock him with royal robes and a crown they mock him with a cross and an inscription, and they mock him with insults and derision. They mock him because they hate him, and they hate him because they've rejected him, because they've rejected his authority, because they've rejected his kingship, because they've rejected his rightful rule, not just over the king of the Jews, but they've rejected his rule as God, as creator. That's the problem they have with Jesus. They've rejected him. And it's the same problem that we have today. It's the same problem that's plagued humanity since the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve, in Genesis chapter 3, what did they do to disobey? You can answer that. What did they do? They ate the fruit. They ate the fruit that God said, do not eat, do not touch. And when they took of that fruit and they ate, what were they doing? They weren't just eating fruit. They were saying to God, we don't want you to rule over us anymore. We don't want you to be the one calling the shots. We'll decide from now on what we're going to do. We will not listen to you. What are they doing? They're rejecting the lordship, the kingship, the sovereignty of God in their lives saying, no, we don't want you to tell us what to do. They're rejecting the authority of God. And that's what you and I do every single time we sin. Right? What are we doing when we sin against God, when we transgress? It's a rejection of God's authority, and it's replacing God's authority, God's right to decide what ought to be done, and we're replacing it with our own authority or maybe some other authority like some philosopher or, or some politician or something, but it's taking God's rightful authority and it's putting it on a human being, usually ourselves. No one can tell me what to do. I decide what is true, what is my truth. 
I decide what I want to do. And the world scoffs at the the kingship of Jesus. The world belittles his glory, his honor, his majesty. They belittle and mock the king of kings. They say that Jesus is not worth following. Not only is he not worth following, it's actually dangerous if you follow Jesus. Look at how Jesus died. Do you not see the kind of death that he was subjected to? And Jesus tells his disciples that if you would follow me, you must what? Deny yourself and take up your cross. Now that doesn't mean that you have to deal with like sore feet and bad knees and a nasty coworker. Do you know what that means to pick up the cross? To bear your own cross? Jesus is saying deny yourself. Remove yourself as your authoritative head and pick up the death march with Jesus. Die to yourself. Crucify your own authority in your life and give it over to God. Well, that's dangerous. Do you see how many of Jesus' followers, Jesus' disciples have died deaths just like him? Some horrific and cruel deaths that that his people have have suffered? The, The world looks at Jesus and they go, Jesus is a loser. He died. And not only did he die, he suffered. And not only did he suffer, he was subjected to the worst form of humiliation and mockery possible. He's a loser because he died a cruel and horrific and dishonorable death. What kind of king dies a criminal's death on a cross? What kind of king does that? A real king wouldn't be dishonored like that. A a, a true king wouldn't wouldn't listen to the voice of scoffers. The rightful king would come down and he would, he would blast all his enemies to hell if he were the real king, wouldn't he? I remember listening, one of my youth leaders back 20 years ago used to tell a story of a preacher he was listening to and he described God, the power of Jesus. Jesus could have called down the entire heavenly host with machine guns and he could have blasted them all to hell. Uh, Well, I'm not sure they would have used machine guns, but I get the point. Jesus could have called all of the angels down in a moment, right? Jesus could have snapped his fingers and destroyed all of his enemies. Jesus didn't even have to do that. He could have blinked. He could have merely willed it in his mind and completely destroyed his enemies. His enemies are described as a vapor, a mist, and they're gone. He could have come down. And he could have come down and blasted them all. Did you notice that that people tell Jesus to come down? He could have come down. We we know that he could have, and people actually tell him to, right? They think that if, if he was really the king of the Jews, he'd come down. Look in verse 30 again. Save yourself, this is the passersby, and come down from the cross. And then down in verse 32, the Sanhedrin, let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. What's their excuse for not believing Jesus? What's their excuse for rejecting him, rejecting his kingship, rejecting his authority? They think that the fact that he's hanging on a cross proves that he's not a good king, not a real king. That dying a criminal's death proves him to be a fraud, a failure, and a disgrace. He's exactly what we thought he was. He's not the real king. And what they failed to see, the passersby, the Sanhedrin, the Roman soldiers, and what even some of us fail to grasp sometimes is that Jesus can't come down from the cross. But not because he doesn't have the power to do it. Not because he's lost that power. Not because the angels with machine guns aren't listening to him anymore, right? It's not because of that. He could have easily come down. His power isn't diminished. Jesus can't come down from the cross because it is, here's the really important point, because it's the will of his Father that he suffer and die the death of crucifixion. It's the will of the Father that Jesus endure the cross and die. That's why he came. That's the purpose of the incarnation. Jesus was born so that he might die. His death is his mission, the point. 
the goal, the reason that he came. The prophet Isaiah reminds us in Isaiah 53, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. It was God's purpose, God's intention, God's desire and the goal of his mission was to find himself hanging on a cross and dying a criminal's death. It was God's will that Jesus drink the cup of God's wrath against sin. It was his will that Jesus die to pay the price for sin. And that's another reason why Jesus can't come down. He can't come down because it's the Father's will, that that his Father said, you will endure. This is the path that you will walk. But Jesus can't come down because if he comes down, there is no salvation. They mock and ridicule Jesus. Come down and save yourself, and then we'll believe. But there is no salvation of sinners if Jesus saves himself. If he comes down from the cross, there is no payment for sin. And if there is no payment for sin, then we are still condemned in our sin. We cannot be saved if Jesus saves himself. They look at Jesus and they think he's a loser. They think he's a loser because he hangs on a tree and he dies. And for most people, death is the end of the story. But Jesus doesn't lose when he dies. Does he? Is his death the end of the story? Is the death the end of the mission? As if it's failed? His death is how he wins. His death is how he conquers the greatest enemies that humanity has ever faced, sin and death itself. Death is overcome. Death is overthrown through his sacrifice. Jesus isn't a fraud or a failure or a disgrace because he dies. He's accomplishing the very purposes of God by dying. He's accomplishing what? The salvation of sinners. He does not lose when he dies. He achieves his victory when he dies. Come behold the wondrous mystery. Christ the Lord upon a tree. In the stead of ruined sinners hangs the lamb in victory. That is is a different kind of king than we could have ever have expected. And this is what they fail to see, what they fail to understand and grasp. They don't understand that Jesus is a different kind of king. They don't understand that he is a, a servant king, a shepherd king, a shepherd king who lays down his life for the sheep. That's why they mock, that's why they scoff, that's why they taunt him. Because they don't see and understand that Jesus is a different kind of king. What about you? How have you responded to this king? There are many who stand at the foot of the cross and they mock. They revile because they think this king is a failure. But this king is not a failure. He's not a fraud and he's not a disgrace. For that, yes, although he died, and he died a horrific and cruel death, he did not remain dead. Did he? Thank you. He did not remain dead. Yes, he entered the grave, but he did not remain in the grave. Come behold the wondrous mystery, slain by death the God of life, but no grave could e'er restrain him. Praise the Lord, he is alive. We do not honor, we do not worship a dead king. We do not fall down, we do not kneel before a bag of bones. We do not worship somebody who was important in history past. We worship a king who sits at the right hand of his father, ruling and reigning right now. He is alive today. He sits on the throne today, and he will for all eternity. We worship a king who died and lives again, so that all who repent of their sins and put their faith in him might actually one day join that king for all eternity. 
There is a day coming. There is a day coming where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. These soldiers bow down in mock reverence, in mock humility, in mock worship. There is a day when those soldiers will be bowing before that King Jesus and the same words will come out of their mouth that came out of their mouths 2,000 years ago, Hail, King of the Jews. And yet it will not be in mockery And it still won't be in worship, but it will be in understanding and acknowledgement that he is who he claimed to be. And that day will be a joyous day for those that trust in Jesus. It will be a day of great rejoicing that the King of kings and Lord of lords has come to take his people home but it will be a day of dread for those who refuse to repent. It will be a day of dread for those who, who just pretend to believe. It will be a day of dread for those who reject Jesus as their king. One day all will see. All will understand that Jesus is the king. Not a dead king. Not a failed king but a glorious and victorious King of kings and Lord of lords. He's not the kind of king the world was looking for. He was unexpected. He's a different kind of king. But he's the king that we need. The question is, will you bow to this king today? Let's pray. King of kings and Lord of lords, glory, hallelujah. Lord, we, we come before you, and though we do not fall down on our knees physically, Lord, we come before you as this king, this great and glorious risen king, this king who entered the grave on our behalf, and we fall down and we worship. We offer our honor and our praise, and we say hail, King of the Jews. Hail the King of Kings. Hail the King of Glory. Hail the King of the Universe. Lord, I pray that you would, you would help us to praise you now as we respond in worship and song. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand as we close our time together in, by singing a hymn. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. And 179.
Let's close our time with a word of prayer. Lord, give us grace to trust you more. Give us grace to follow you faithfully. Give us grace to to remind ourselves each and every day of the sacrifice of our Savior. May we not be ashamed of our King. Even though the world may want to heap on the mockery and the shame and the humiliation, Lord, may we not be ashamed. May we not be ashamed of our King, our servant King, who served in our place, who died in our stead. And may we tell others, may we show others this great gospel of grace that saves sinners. I pray now that as we, we move downstairs, as we fellowship around, around pizza, may you bless that food to our bodies and our bodies to your use. May this continue, Lord. May our worship continue, even though we end our time here now. It's in the name of our Savior that we pray. Amen. May the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.